Today I am joined by Dr. Vince Cerf, the father of the internet, the recipient of so many awards, I actually cannot list all of them, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, all the way to 24 different honorary doctorates from universities. Uh, Dr. Cerf, thank you for being with us here today and talking about your top five strengths. Thank you very much for having me uh, in this discussion, John. Uh, I always enjoy exploring these kinds of ideas. As somebody that leads with futuristic input, communication, uh, strategic and analytical, what would you say to those that have a similar top five in terms of how they should be leading with their strengths? Well, uh, you know, first of all, I think that those strengths are really a, a cool combination of things. I mean, I really, I really like uh, the fact that those are my strengths because uh, I resonate with them. I guess that's not too surprising, is it? I mean, <laughs> uh, but they, they feel like a really neat combination of capacities that uh, uh, allow me to uh, survive and thrive in challenging environments where, uh, I, you know, where I have to learn that I could be wrong sometimes. And, uh, and that my ideas may not always be the right ones. Uh, the, the comfort level uh, with that notion, I think, is really important. I think leadership uh, is not about being absolutely right all the time. It's about recognizing when you're not right and changing your mind. Now, Vin, your top five strengths, futuristic input, communication, strategic, and analytical. With such a successful career, what strength would you say that it is that helped you become so successful? Well, you know, that's an interesting combination of strengths. Uh, when you think about it, what, you know, what do they translate into? They translate into openness to new ideas, uh, futuristic. I'm optimistic about the future, even though you know we're, we have many challenges uh, in today's world. Uh, but it's my uh, belief that uh, technology is our friend, even when sometimes it isn't. Um, I like the idea of understanding things deeply enough so that you can be strategic as well as tactical uh, in terms of using technology or exploring possibilities. Uh, one of the things I learned is that you can't really predict the future, but what you can do is look at trends, for example, and try to get a sense for what what future possibilities there are, some of them, you know, positive and some of them not so, so positive, but the ability just to imagine what those possible futures are uh, is a, a way of helping you to figure out, well, what's the best thing I can do right now? So uh, I think all of those the little package of, uh, of strengths allows me to engage with a wide range of people uh, you know, and a wide range of technology. Uh, even when I don't understand it, I have a thirst for understanding it. And so I'm open to the input that, uh, that I uh, gain from some of those conversations. Man, if you, can't, if you can't listen to other people, how the heck are you gonna learn anything? People with Futuristic are always thinking in the future. And a few of the concepts that you've been talking about more frequently are things like the interplanetary internet, about bit vellum to make sure that we are protecting uh, the bits in so many of uh, you know, the technology things that we have today. How far do you think into the future as somebody with Futuristic? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a great science fiction fan, and so I love reading science fiction stories. I started reading these science fiction stories in the 1950s. And so future then was 2000. I mean, 2000 was holy moly, you know, it's 50 years from now. Uh, imagine what that's going to be like. Of course, now it's 2023. Uh, and I've lived through the 2000s. And I've been, frankly, I've been disappointed. I mean, the first two decades of the 21st century, it frankly suck. Uh, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of good things have happened, but a lot of bad things have happened as well. So uh, I have to admit to you that now future for me is you know, more like 2050, 2075, 2100. Um, nonetheless, all of those uh, stories were helpful because uh, they allowed me to share uh, with the authors of those stories 
uh, their imaginings for what could possibly happen. Uh, and in many cases, what could possibly go right and what could possibly go wrong? Uh, it strikes me as anyone who's interested in what the future holds needs to keep in mind that sometimes things may not go the way you plan the, for them to go, and you need to be prepared for that. Throughout your incredible career, as you were using futuristic, as you were thinking years and years into the future, is there anything that you believe that you saw that no one else did? I don't know that I could claim that I foresaw things that, uh, that no one else did. I think uh, a more accurate sense is that I'm willing to spend a lot of time on, uh, on projects uh, that take a lot of time for uh, fruition. So as an example, uh, the internet design work that I did with Bob Kahn started in 1973. And we weren't able to turn the internet on in some really definitive way for 10 years. It's January 1, 1983. And uh, anyone who's paid attention to the history of the internet will know that a great deal has happened since 1983. Um, and so I am, and I'm still at it. I mean, the internet continues to evolve. There are all kinds of new things that we've been able to do, partly because of the increased capacity of the system. And, uh, and so uh, this this willingness to make long-term commitments and to spend a great deal of time is, I think, thematic. So another example, which you mentioned earlier, is the interplanetary internet work that began in 1998. So that's 25 years ago. And with the expectation that we should be doing something then that we were going to need 25 years later. So here we are, it's 25 years later. And as you can see from the headlines, we are on the cusp of a return to space, uh, that we are going to be moving out into the rest of the solar system. Some of it may actually be commercially motivated. Even the return to the moon, the Artemis mission includes mining on the moon, commercial mining on the moon. So it's literally around the corner. Uh, and, and so I pride myself, I guess, on my willingness to be patient and persistent in some of these projects. When you were working on developing email, when you think about your futuristic, what was your vision for it? And now that we use email so much today, I think that there are literally billions of emails that are sent by humanity every single day. Um, was your vision realized or what were you thinking at that particular time? Well, uh, first of all, remember that uh, the notion of network email uh, arises out of the ARPANET project while I'm at UCLA as a graduate student. So that's 1971. Uh, and we all instantly recognized the utility of deferred communication. Uh, it was faster than sending postal mail, but it had the benefit that you didn't both have to be awake at the same time in order to communicate. Uh, so it was a very powerful enabler. Uh, during the ARPANET project, and we recognized it as such. Uh, I didn't start working on MCI Mail at MCI until 1983, so or late 82. And it was already a well-established uh, practice in the academic world, but it wasn't available to the general public. And so uh, the project internally was called the Digital Post Office, and the idea was that we were building a different kind of postal service that was online and, and computer uh, based. Frankly, I think we were probably about 10 years early because uh, laptops were not available at the time and uh, desktops were just becoming available to the general public. Uh, by 1992, uh, I can remember people apologizing when they handed me their business cards saying, I don't have my email on the business card yet, or I don't have email yet. And that, that was literally 20 years after the notion of network email surfaced uh, in the research community. So uh, I'm, I am persuaded that uh, this is just one of a number of different communication mechanisms that uh, help us stay connected to each other and stay in touch and stay up to date. I still feel avalanched uh, by email, especially if I have meetings all day long so I can't see the email until I get home at night. And then after dinner, I'm answering emails until 11 o'clock at night. Um, there's something not right about that, but I don't know quite what to do about it. What are you concerned about in terms of what you see in the future right now? Well, I am very concerned, of course, uh, that we have very fundamental challenges as a civilization. The global warming problem is, is absolutely uh, 
I would say, the, a dire threat. Uh, now, we've been wrong in the past about dire threats. For example, the population bomb. Uh, what happened is that we learned how to feed more people. Uh, the new methods of agriculture, uh, fertilizers and things like that, uh, genetically modified or hybrid crops that produce larger uh, quantities of food, uh, more efficient farming, all of those things have enabled us to support a much larger population than we thought we could. On the other hand, those same mechanisms have also produced some bad side effects. And uh, so uh, we are facing some really tough problems uh, that lie ahead. We're experiencing that literally today as we, as we speak out on the West Coast, where California is experiencing some fairly severe storms, some of which I think are attributable to the uh, rise in, in temperature. So, uh, so we have that big problem. We also have uh, a, a serious problem in the information technology world of uh, misinformation and disinformation, which is indistinguishable uh, from uh, where, where truth and falsehood are become indistinguishable. Uh, it gets worse when we start thinking about deep fakes where we can produce imagery uh, that uh, looks indistinguishable from uh, you know, live video and yet it's actually been fabricated Parties are made to appear to say and do things that they didn't actually do or say. Uh, and that can lead to all kinds of serious uh, negative consequences. So we, we are living in an increasingly complex world where we have to be conscious of those potential hazards. And so I have this feeling that we're not teaching young people and ourselves or older people um, about these hazards and these risks we need to do that so that people are aware of, uh, of what problems they might encounter in this information-rich environment. And I use the word information-rich because information isn't always true. <laughs> Some of it's false. And so you may be information-rich, but it may be filled with, with uh, false, uh, false information. We need to learn how to, how to deal with that. And I think we haven't yet learned to do it. So my simple rubric for this is sort of like maybe we should have an internet driver's license where you have to learn what the risk factors are before you're allowed to use the internet. Of course, I'm not literally proposing that, but I think the training programs that would lead up to an internet driver's license uh, would be actually useful in the same way that we teach driver's ed in order to make sure that people have been exposed to uh, good practices for safe driving. Your number three strength is communication. How did you see communication as something that was helpful and useful to you throughout your entire career? Well, uh, first of all, I enjoyed reading and I enjoyed writing. Uh, and that includes, you know, poetry and, uh, and not so much short stories. I really suck at dialogue, which is really too bad. Uh, not too shabby on description, but really crappy with dialogue. Um, so I enjoyed finding ways to express myself. I love words. Uh, I love, you know, crossword puzzles. I love word puns. Uh, language is fascinating. So uh, for, for uh, most of my uh, career, the idea of finding ways to communicate ideas, to get people to understand what you're thinking, to get the model in your head into their head, uh, has been a very important objective for me, and communication, of course, is the means by which we do that. So um, I'm, I've found, in retrospect, looking back on my career, I discovered that in order to do something big, uh, it's really smart to get help, especially from people who are smarter than you are. And, and so that's a sales job. And so I learned very quickly that if I couldn't communicate my ideas and enthusiasm for doing something or getting something to happen, then I wouldn't get any help. And so learning how to communicate those ideas and to generate excitement and to generate commitment uh, was really important. And I believe that to this day, that if you can't communicate your ideas well, you won't get any help and you won't do anything very big. You know, one of the things that we've seen in our database now is that engagement is dropping among workplaces. And one of the reasons is 
is that we are now living in a more asynchronous world, especially now that so many more people are working in a hybrid or working remotely. Um, and that sort of asynchronous communication is causing us to write to each other. And that failure to understand each other is really a challenge. What would you say to people as someone who does excel in communication, especially in the written word? What do we need to do now as leaders in order to improve that so that we do understand each other through the written word? So this is interesting. Um, I tend to be rather terse. You wouldn't guess it from our conversation, <laughs> but, I, but my email exchanges are very brief. Uh, I tend to boil things down to one or two sentences and sometimes just one or two words. And I'm sure some of my colleagues uh, find that amusing. Um, on the other hand, I have other colleagues who, you know, if I ask a question, I get back a dissertation. Hmm. Uh, I think brevity is important. Uh, capturing the essence of something you know, is important because people won't remember, you know, a 500 word essay, but they might remember a one, you know, one sentence uh, statement. Uh, so uh, my view is that brevity is important. I am a heavy user of email, um, partly because uh, I started using it when it was invented in 1971. And I found it useful partly because I'm hearing impaired. And so uh, audio conversations have some risk factors associated with them if I didn't hear you know, the, the key word in a sentence. Uh, so written communication for me is important partly because of my hearing impairment. Uh, and so I've gravitated to jobs that involve the use of email. What I believe is that you can maintain um, relationships uh, in written form, uh, even, but they need to be reinforced from time to time by face-to-face -face meetings. Even this one, which I'm thoroughly enjoying, um, isn't quite the same as sitting at the same table and enjoying a meal together uh, or getting up and having a big argument on the whiteboard. Uh, and so you need those reinforcing moments. But I think as long as they are there uh, occasionally, you can maintain quite a good uh, working relationship uh, with, uh, uh, with written communication. I will say that uh, the, during this pandemic, where we were all so isolated from each other, the ability to do this kind of conversation that we're doing right now, I think has made a significant difference. It still isn't the same as being in the same room, sharing an experience together, but it's uh, probably better than uh, purely written communication. Now, let me go back in history for just a second, because I want to uh, observe that uh, the brief kinds of communications, short email kinds of exchanges, are very different from the kinds of written exchanges that you would have seen in uh, two or 300 years ago or even earlier. Um, because the means of communication uh, was, uh, was very high latency for any distant uh, parts. So, you know, if you were in Europe trying to communicate with somebody in the New World, uh, it could take weeks uh, for letters to be exchanged. The consequence of that is that people tended to write longer letters and to try to be as, um, to communicate as much as possible in those letters because you knew that you weren't going to be there to explain anything and also that the exchanges would be infrequent. Now that we have these very rapid exchanges, whether it's, you know, texting or TikTok or, you know, five second videos or what have you, uh, we are actually losing some of the quality of thoughtful uh, exchange, thoughtful discourse. And so I wonder whether we need to do something about that in order to improve the quality of the exchange. What do we do? Uh, well, one possibility, of course, is that meeting face to face tends to force you into an extended dialogue, uh, like the one that we're having right now. And it's, it's the, the necessities of extended dialogue are really important. Uh, one of the things that I learned from Sherry Turkle, who's an MIT professor who's written a number of books, one of which was called Alone Together. She was describing teenagers with their mobiles sitting around the table or in a shopping mall, not even talking to each other, but you know, texting on their mobiles with somebody else who wasn't part of the crowd. And the, hence the Alone Together uh, rubric. 
what she was getting at, though, is that the, uh, these kids were finding that texting had the property that if you didn't respond, it was okay. Whereas if you were in a telephone conversation or a conversation like this one, if you asked me a question and I didn't know what to say and I and, and I, I so I didn't respond, the awkwardness of that silence uh, is notable. And the, stu the, the the teenagers who were using texting took advantage of the fact that they could avoid the awkwardness because they were excused from not responding because it was understood that in texting conditions, you might not be able to respond because you got distracted or some other more important thing happened. And so you could escape the awkwardness of silence. Whereas if you, so the kids don't talk to each other on the phone hmm. uh, anymore. It's because they don't know what to do when they encounter a moment of, of awkwardness. Now, people with input have an unusual ability to never stop asking questions. You have an unusual ability to do that. What are your thoughts on inspiring others to do the same thing, especially when we live in a world today where humanity does such a great job of communicating, but we may not do as good of job as listening? And you have shown through your unique ability to ask questions that you are a great listener. What do we do to inspire the rest of the world and other world leaders to do exactly the same thing? Oh, listen, it's very simple. Uh, you don't learn anything unless you shut up and listen. And you probably don't learn anything unless you ask questions. There are no stupid questions. There may be stupid answers, but there, may, there are no stupid questions. And some people will come and, and hesitate to ask a question because they don't want to sound stupid. My reaction is, listen, if you don't know the answer and you want to know the answer, ask the question. And, uh, and then, of course, you have to evaluate the answers you get back, because sometimes you may get back stupid answers. Uh, but, but questions are and always should be welcome. Now, people with input oftentimes love when there are people who challenge their thinking. Who do you look to in order to challenge your own thinking? Well, uh, many of my colleagues here and some of the people who report to me, uh, I actually have to uh, insist that they challenge me uh, if, uh, if my um, articulations don't make any sense or if they think I'm going down a bad path. There are a lot of people, especially in Asian cultures, who are very reluctant to challenge authority. And, uh, and that's the, the essence of good leadership is being willing to accept challenges and to respond to people who are saying to you, uh, you know, that uh, you're about to walk off the edge of a cliff. I have, I have occasionally told my engineers, if you don't tell me I'm about to do something stupid, uh, then at the end of the year, your fitness rating is going to suffer because you should have told me if you knew ahead of time I was doing something dumb. Uh, and so I have to insist on, uh, on people uh, feeling comfortable saying, you know, wait a minute, have you thought about X, Y, and Z? Some people say, well, you're the leader. You, didn't you already figure that out? And, and have you discarded all the negative consequences? And the answer is no, because I didn't think of that one. So uh, I really uh, did, you know, want that kind of challenging input. It's valuable. People with input consume an incredible amount of information. What is it that you consume? What kind of information are you constantly consuming in order to keep yourself informed on virtually everything? Well, I'm not informed on everything, but it, it, uh, but I do feel like I'm in, inundated with input. Uh, first of all, um, again, I use email a lot. And the consequence of that is that people draw my attention to a, a wide range of articles, videos, and other things. I learn a lot from that. It's wonderful. They are acting as filters on my behalf because they're exposed to all kinds of material that I don't normally see. And so they draw my attention to that. I'm truly very grateful for that. And that's an example of input. Uh, another kind of input, of course, is just subscribing to a lot of different uh, scientific and technical magazines, which I try religiously to try to, to read through when I can. Uh, and I enjoy that very much, uh, especially like the first half of Science Magazine, which is written in plain English, and not, as opposed to the second half, which is absolutely not written in plain English. <laughs> um, so uh, I get great value uh, from those kinds of exchanges. Uh, that I do find that I uh, ask people uh, 
uh, when I'm when I'm deeply am trying to understand something, I often ask them to draw me a picture, uh, and I don't mean literally, you know, sketching a photograph, but uh, but you know, show me a diagram or give me some uh, visual model of what it is that we're talking about. I find myself reacting very positively to these kinds of, of uh, visual models. Uh, it helps me enormously to organize uh, my thinking about complex systems if we can see uh, a kind of block diagram of the various pieces at the right level of abstraction. So I've learned, and many of my friends have learned, that uh, if I'm not understanding what they're saying, they need to draw me a diagram. And uh, it's amazing how that can cause your understanding to suddenly become much clearer. You have analytical number five, and one thing that's so important to people with analytical is getting the data right. People with analytical consume an incredible amount of data. Now that we're living in this world of big data all the way to fake news, how do you know when you feel like you've got it right? Well, well first of all, you, you have to learn in the business I'm in that you don't always have all the data that you want. And the decisions have to be made in the presence of, uh, or in the absence of, of uh, all the information you would like. But that's where judgment and guesswork and imagination uh, really count, uh, because you have to make up for the lack of, of data uh, with uh, some of these other properties. On the other hand, to the extent that you can get the data and you can use that information to uh, uh, eliminate misunderstandings, eliminate untruths uh, is really important. I mean, in this world of misinformation and disinformation, finding uh, good data is uh, is a big challenge. Partly because, as you say, uh, you can fabricate data now. You know, we're in the we're in the mis in the fake data, fake news uh, uh, world now, where our artificially intelligent engines are generating stuff which turns out to be wrong. I mean, some of the large language models and the chatbots that you encounter in today's world are capable of sounding absolutely articulate and being absolutely dead wrong because they were trained with data that turns out to be incorrect. Uh, or they conflate things because of the mechanics of machine learning that, don't, that should not be conflated. Uh, and so learning to think critically about what you're seeing and hearing and even about the data that you're shown is really important. I mean, I... I'm a big fan of, uh, of spreadsheets, for example, when you're trying to figure out, you know, numerical information and how do things all, you know, hang together. And uh, some of the most important things that for me in looking at that kind of information is to figure out whether some of the numbers will tell you that there must be something wrong. You know, like this number and this number should add up to that number. And if they don't, there's something wrong in the spreadsheet. And I know my staff probably go crazy because I'm always saying, you know what, there's something wrong with this computation. And, uh, and they say, well, I just plugged the number in. And I said, well, that shows because it doesn't compute. So, uh, so being able to tease apart uh, evidence that the data is wrong uh, is really valuable. You've had so many amazing partners throughout your career. How have you leveraged the strengths of others to help them become successful? Everybody knows things that I don't know. That's why one of life's lessons is you can learn something new from almost anybody you meet. And it's important to keep that in mind. They've all had experiences that you haven't had. And you can learn something from that. Um, I found working together with other people to be enormously enabling. Uh, it, my favorite situation is in front of the whiteboard, you know, having this giant knockdown, drag out argument about what's the right way to get something to work. Um, so for me, uh, I find this partnership to be extremely energizing. I'm, I'm not a, uh, a lone thinker. Uh, I think better when I'm having a discussion, when I'm trying to explain to somebody why I think X is true, when it could, <laughs> often turns out that as I'm explaining why I think it's true, I realize why it's wrong. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the most powerful tools I've ever had uh, experienced for finding bugs in software is to take a piece of code which is not working properly and to sit down with someone who's knowledgeable and to say, let me explain to you why this is supposed to work. 
And, uh, and sure enough, as you walk your way through why it's supposed to work, either the other person or you will re realize uh, where it is that an assumption was made that was wrong. And I have to tell you, if there's ever a life lesson to keep in mind, it's that whenever I really screw up badly, it's because I made an assumption that turned out to be wrong. And so I have to keep reminding myself, OK, what assumptions am I making? in the course of trying to decide what to do or how to design something or how to build it or how to test it. What are my assumptions? Question your assumptions.